Sape satta bhavantu sukhitatta bhavantu sukhitatta Hello, I'm Dharmasar Taro, and I'm here with the 21st episode of Nibbana, the secret treasure of the Buddhas. Now, why is Nibbana such a secret? Well, it's because the original significance of the term Nibbana was undermined by speculative etymology of the scholar monks about a thousand to fifteen hundred years ago in Sri Lanka. So, if we look back to the original suttas, we see that the Buddha's explanation of the term Nibbana is different from the contemporary understanding or the understanding given in the commentaries. Why is this important? Well, I got a comment the other day from a friend saying, why are you giving so much intellectual discussion about something that is ultimately beyond words, beyond the mind? And yes, we are uh, dedicating a lot of words to something that's beyond words. And that's because so many inaccurate words have been given. So many wrong explanations have been proposed for this idea of Nibbana, extinction, cooling, appeasement. This is the goal of the Buddha's teaching. And as we'll find out in the next episode, it's, we cannot say anything about it. But we can talk about the way to get to Nibbana. And the central thing, the most important thing, the first step on the path to Nibbana is right view. The Eightfold Noble Path begins from right view. If we don't have right view, well, it's just as if, let's say, we have a mathematics problem that takes eight pages of calculations to solve. Now, if we make a mistake on the first page, then the rest of our calculations are all going to be off. The answer we get is going to be wrong. And this is what is happening. People now have the wrong view about Nibbana. They're putting Nibbana in an incorrect context. And as we've been over many times, especially in our previous series on learning and on understanding and how to uh, conceptualize things properly, the context determines the meaning. You know, I ought to get a parrot and I ought to train him to say, context determines meaning, Rawr! context determines meaning because this is such an important concept. Where did I get that idea? Oh, my physics teacher in high school brought his parrot into the class one day. And he had trained his parrot to say, F equals MA. <laughs> F equals MA is one of the most important fundamental equations in physics. And if you know that, and a handful of other very simple equations, you can mathematically derive the entire physics, including relativity. So just by understanding this one term, Nibbana, in the proper context, you can derive the rest of the Buddha's teaching independently. Because it's Dhamma, it's truth, it is what is and the way it is, and why it is the way it is. That's what's the meaning of Dhamma. So Nibbana is something that's beyond explanation. That's true. But to experience Nibbana requires a certain mental frame, a certain setup, a certain context. So we're giving that context so that you can understand Nibbana and so that you can personally realize the Buddha's teaching. So before we go on, I want to encourage you to read all of the suttas linked in our documentation. You should download the documentation. There's a link on the comments or on the description of every video. 
If you don't, you won't have the access to the context that explains the real meaning of Nibbana, which is in the Theravada Suttas. Now, the problem is that Nibbana is not the only term used in the suttas to describe the end of suffering, which is the Buddha's objective. So there are other terms such as Dukkhanirodo, Tanhakayo, and many more, uh, actually more than 30 different terms, describing the ultimate goal of the Buddha's teaching. Why do we settle on Nibbana? It's because of the fire simile. And we went over the fire simile in the previous videos in this series, which you should take a look at. So if we understand Nibbana properly, we would never use phrases like attaining Nibbana or obtaining, getting Nibbana or going to Nibbana. However, we find in the commentaries that they are full of these, what are called periphrastic phrases. A periphrastic phrase is something that is used to describe an object by attributing some quality to that object that it doesn't really possess. So if we say going to Nibbana, that attributes the attribute of a location to Nibbana, but Nibbana doesn't have a location. Or if we say, I will attain Nibbana, that gives it the attribute of being in the future. However, Nibbana is beyond time. It's timeless, a kalika. So by attributing some uh, qualities or attributes to Nibbana that it doesn't actually have, then we misunderstand and we create an incorrect context. And because of that, the meaning of Nibbana becomes distorted and it makes it harder or even impossible to attain it. Now, I want to talk about the holy life, Brahmacharya. Brahmacharya in Pali has a different meaning than it does in Sanskrit. In Sanskrit, it is used to indicate celibacy. But Brahmacharya actually doesn't mean celibacy. It means a life of spirit. So, or one who resides in the spirit, one who lives in the spirit, okay? It's not really a synonym for celibacy. That's a modern usage. But in the Buddha's teaching, brahmacharya means the holy life, the life of a monk. Celibacy is incidental to the life of a monk. But it's not really what the life of a monk is all about. The life of a monk is actually about attaining Nibbana. What now, friend, is the holy life? And who is a follower of the holy life? And what is the final goal of the holy life? The Buddha answers, This noble eightfold path, friend, is the holy life. That is, right view, right resolve, right speech, right action right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, right concentration. One who possesses this noble eightfold path is called one who lives the holy life. The destruction of lust, the destruction of hatred, the destruction of delusion. This, friend, is the final goal of the holy life. And of course, the Buddha is talking about Nibbana the final goal, the object for which the holy life is lived. In other words, the holy life is not an end unto itself. It's only a means to an end. And when that end is reached, then there are no more rules. <laughs> In the uh, uh, simile of the raft, the Buddha talks about someone who's being pursued by armed men. And he comes to a river. Very, very uh, fast, rushing stream. No way can he go across. So he makes a raft out of limbs of trees and sticks and twigs, and he pushes this raft into the river and paddles it across by means of his arms and legs. And when he gets to the other side, what does he do? Does he 
keep the raft and drag it along with him wherever he goes? No, no. He simply drops it on the bank and walks away a free man. So in the same way, when we attain Nibbana, or when we reach Nibbana, <laughs> when we realize Nibbana, language is so difficult, we let go of all the rules and the procedures and the uh, practices that got us there. We don't need them anymore. But to get to that point, we have to follow them. And we have to have the proper context to attain right view. Otherwise, everything else we do is simply going to lead us astray. Now I want to share with you another sutta where the Venerable Radha puts a series of questions to the Buddha and here are his answers. Venerable Sir, for what purpose is right view? Radha, it is for disenchantment. Venerable Sir, for what purpose is disenchantment? Radha, it is for dispassion. Venerable Sir, for what purpose is dispassion? Radha, it is for release. Venerable Sir, for what purpose is release? Radha, it is for extinction, Nibbana. Venerable Sir, for what purpose is extinction? Radha, it is not possible to answer that question. Extinction is the final end. The holy life is lived to reach extinction, and it is the end. So the Buddha is saying, now Radha, you've gone beyond the scope of questions. Because Nibbana is something that cannot be explained in words. Therefore, it's not possible to answer or even ask questions about it. More than that, if the purpose of the holy life is to reach Nibbana, is to realize Nibbana, then Nibbana has no further purpose beyond that. We can't say that the purpose of Nibbana is this or that because it is the end, it is the ultimate, it is beyond the beyond. It's inexplicable. So therefore, we can only talk about the process leading up to the realization of Nibbana. We can't really talk about what comes afterwards. Let me give uh, another sutta as illustration for this. It's about the Buddha's cousin, Venerable Nanda. Uh, Nanda was the son of the Buddha's maternal aunt. So as Buddha's cousin, of course, he had some standing in the community of monks. But listen to what happens. Venerable Nanda went to the Blessed One, and on arrival, having bowed down to him, sat on one side. As he was sitting there, the Blessed One said to him, Is it true, Nanda, that you have announced to a large number of monks I don't enjoy leading the holy life, my friends. I can't keep up the holy life. Giving up the training, I will return to the common life. Yes, Lord. But why, Nanda, don't you enjoy leading the holy life? Why can't you keep up the holy life? Why, giving up the training, will you return to the common life? Lord, as I was leaving home, a Sakyan girl, the envy of the countryside, glanced up at me with her hair half combed and said, Hurry back, Master. Recollecting that, I don't enjoy leading the holy life. I can't keep up the holy life. Giving up the training, I will return to the common life. Then, taking Venerable Nanda by the arm, as a strong man might flex his extended arm or extend his flexed arm, the Blessed One disappeared from Jeta's grove and reappeared among the devas of the heaven of the 33, Tavatimsa. Now on that occasion, about 500 dove-footed nymphs had come to wait upon Sakka, the ruler of the devas. The Blessed One said to Venerable Nanda, Nanda, 
Do you see these 500 dove-footed nymphs? Yes, Lord. What do you think, Nanda? Which is lovelier, better looking, more charming? The Sakyan girl, the envy of the countryside, or these 500 dove-footed nymphs? Lord, compared to these 500 dove-footed nymphs, the Sakyan girl, the envy of the countryside, is like a cauterized monkey with its ears and nose cut off. <laughs> she doesn't count. She's not even a small fraction. There's no comparison. The 500 dove-footed nymphs are lovelier, better looking, more charming. Then take joy, Nanda, take joy. I am your guarantor for getting 500 dove-footed nymphs. If the Blessed One is my guarantor for getting 500 dove-footed nymphs, I will enjoy leading the holy life under the Blessed One. Then, taking Venerable Nanda by the arm, as a strong man might flex his extended arm or extend his flexed arm, the Blessed One disappeared from among the devas of the heaven of the 33 and reappeared at Jeta's grove. The monks heard, They say that Venerable Nanda, the Blessed One's cousin brother, son of his maternal aunt, is leading the holy life for the sake of nymphs. They say that the Blessed One is his guarantor for getting 500 dove-footed nymphs. Then the monks who were companions of Venerable Nanda went around addressing him as they would a hired hand, a person who had been bought. Old Nanda, they say, has been hired. Old Nanda, they say, has been bought. He's leading the holy life for the sake of nymphs. The Blessed One is his guarantor for getting 500 dove-footed nymphs. Then, Venerable Nanda, humiliated, ashamed, and disgusted that the monks who were his companions were addressing him as they would a hired hand and a person who had been bought, went to dwell alone, secluded, heedful, ardent, and resolute. He in no long time entered and remained in the supreme goal of the holy life for which clansmen rightly go forth from home into homelessness, knowing and realizing it for himself, right in the here and now. He knew birth is ended, the holy life fulfilled, the task done, and there is nothing further for the sake of this world. And thus, Venerable Nanda, became another one of the Arhats. Great story, huh? And then, of course, he went back to the Buddha and said, Buddha, uh, I relieve you of your promise. <laughs> I don't need these 500 nymphs anymore. And the Buddha said, I know. <laughs> so you can read the whole thing if you go to the link in the documentation. It's really quite charming. So, as a cousin of the Buddha, he was a member of the royal family. And Nanda was addicted to sense pleasures, just like everyone today is. Uh, it wasn't so common back in those days. But now, everyone is thinking, oh yes, let me develop mindfulness so I can make more money. Huh? This is what's going on. Well, this is nonsense. The purpose of bright mindfulness as a part of the Eightfold Path depends on the context of it being part of the way to realizing Nibbana, not to realizing more money. Huh? The path of the holy life is lived not for the sake of any material benefit, but only for the purpose of realizing Nibbana. If one uses any of the techniques in the Buddha's path for some other object, then it's not the Buddha's path anymore. You have taken something out of context and misused it for some other purpose. It won't give the same result. So how can people sit down and meditate wanting to be happy, wanting peace of mind, wanting sense enjoyment, wanting success, and so on like that. It's ridiculous. 
uh, that's changing the meaning of Nibbana. And when the, the scholar monks changed the meaning of Nibbana, they had a definite purpose in mind. They wanted to make Buddhism accessible to the common people. They wanted to turn it into a mass religious movement. And they did. But in the process, they lost the original meaning and the context of real Nibbana. Sabbe Satta Bhavantu Sukitatta Bhavantu Sukitatta